Hello, this is Valdemar Janusczak, art critic, producer and presenter of documentaries. Thanks for watching Perspective, YouTube's home for classical art. New York, the city is massive. Manhattan, magnificent. It is one of the most densely populated city districts in the world. Every morning, the number of residents doubles, and an additional one and a half million people travel over the bridges and through the skyscraper canyons, filling them with energy. Manhattan was and is the final goal for many. If you make it here, you can make it anywhere. Everyone wants success, and everyone has to fight for it. New York and art? It's a mutual love affair. After the Second World War, immigrants from Europe turned Manhattan into the capital of contemporary art. Nowhere else are there so many artists, so many galleries and art museums, and nowhere else is the art market so buoyant. New York is booming and studios and apartments have long become unaffordable, but the city is slowly reacting. It doesn't want to lose what has for so long been one of its most important attributes. It's early morning in Manhattan. In Grand Central Station, more than 50,000 commuters are arriving every half hour. The streets are congested. It's hard to get a cab. It's an overcast and cold day, not the weather for a grand overture. And yet, on this morning in the new business quarter of the Hudson River, a world debut will take place. A cultural factory for the 21st century, a spectacular new building for all forms of art and media. Good morning and welcome. I'm Dan Doctoroff, and I have the privilege of being the founding chair of the Shed's Board of Directors. But when the story of the Shed began in 2005, all it was was a small square on a map, a placeholder for a to-be-determined cultural institution. We had no idea what it was going to be. It's unpleasant outside, and the architects of the Shed are waiting across the way for their call to the stage. Liz Diller and David Rockwell formed a collaborative team to create the cultural factory, simply called The Shed. Hello. Thank you all your brave people for sticking this out. Uh, I'm Liz Diller. The Shed started for us 11 years ago when the site was just a, dot a dotted line on a satellite photo describing a piece of property reserved for an unknown cultural use. place for all the arts and all creative disciplines and for collaborations that we cannot imagine what the products are going to be. And that's the really sort of beautiful challenge of making something for the future, a future that we can't possibly predict. Only a few months previously, Liz Diller was on the High Line, a former elevated railway for whose reconstruction she was responsible, turning it into a living garden walkway. Together with the composer David Lang, she created an opera on the High Line, and this is the dress rehearsal. The High Line leads directly to the already clearly recognizable new build, the Shed. The architect on the rooftop of her office. She also designed one of these skyscrapers together with David Rockwell. Three important building blocks of this new district were designed by her, and her story started here, just as the Hudson Yards did, with the initially insignificant High Line. When we did the High Line, we thought optimistically 300,000 people would come. Um, and we talked about how important it was to have a green space in this area that has very, very little green open space. Um, and this area was totally in decline after the meatpacking district was dissolved and all of the small businesses were going out of business. And, and so there was nothing but a sea of open parking lots. And so we felt that almost anything we did to the High Line could improve things a little bit. 
Before the turn of the millennium, a local citizen's initiative prevented the demolition of the decommissioned tracks and collected ideas for public use. The architects Diller, Scofidio and Renfro created a design, and with the success of the High Line, they too became world famous. We never imagined. In 2016, there were seven and a half million visitors to the High Line. And the uh, property around the High Line, which was without value before, now kept getting flipped and flipped and flipped, and the value continued to increase, and now it's some of the most expensive real estate in New York. The High Line cuts through the new business district. Over the next few years, a good dozen new skyscrapers are planned. More than 60,000 people will work and live here, and many thousands will shop here daily. It is planned as a new smart Manhattan neighborhood, designed also to relieve the old congested midtown around the Empire State Building. A great city is never finished. It's constantly evolving. It really is a platform um, for innovation and change. We always thought of New York City as a competitive entity. We're competing with other cities around the world for their jobs, for their residents, uh, for visitors. Uh, and we always saw Hudson Yards as a key aspect in that competitive battle. Hudson Yards was practically undeveloped at the beginning. A web of railway tracks going from west to east, carrying commuters from New Jersey to Penn Station, a vital hub for Manhattan. This station will also be modernized. Overall, it is the largest new construction project in the history of the United States. It came about really because um, there was a site that nobody could figure out how to build on top of because it's an active rail yard. So once that happened, it offered the opportunity to build in this area and the zoning changed. In all of the metropolises of the world, new and modern business districts are being built vertically because space is at a premium. The land correspondingly expensive, just like the technical infrastructure. On top of that, the daily commutes are to be kept to a minimum. Midtown, which is sort of the main office district in New York, is old. Um, the average age of a building, commercial building, in Midtown is probably 70 years old. Well, companies and workers work differently today than they did, dramatically differently. Um, and their needs are much different. And so we felt that for New York to be competitive, we had to create um, a competitive market for commercial tenants, and that was really fundamental. In a time of climate change, Hudson Yards has the advantage of its location on a river. It has been conceived as a mixed quarter where people can live and work. Thanks to the generous public spaces with their cafes, shops and restaurants and many green areas, it will remain a vibrant and urban centre even after office closing time. Hudson Yards is also an opportunity uh, to show what's possible when you actually do combine smart urban design with technology. The scale of the project is enormous, and the way that people think about it is it changes the equilibrium of Manhattan, where it used to be in Midtown, and everything was sort of built, actually, also topographically. The highest buildings were right in the middle and tapered off to the edges of Manhattan. Now we have something that's very unusual. We have this very, very tall, high-rise development right at the edge of Manhattan.
is booming. An ever-increasing number of people are moving here. New skyscrapers are being built everywhere. There is a gold rush atmosphere. But it hasn't always been this way. In the 90s of the 20th century, the city went through a deep depression. Many companies moved away, and the first decade of the new millennium shook Manhattan to its very foundations. Every year on September 11th, people come together at Ground Zero at the memorial across from the new One World Trade Center. They commemorate the many lives lost in the terror attack on Manhattan in 2001. No bailout for Lehman Brothers meant moving day for most of the firm's 12,000 employees here in New York. I prefer not to talk about it. But... How long have you worked for Lehman, sir? Subprime mortgages helped cause the company's crisis. The new high-rise boom south of Central Park began in 2010, soon followed by more extremely narrow skyscrapers reserved for apartments only, over 300 meters high, with expensive apartments that are sought after worldwide. If Central Park in its present state and scenery is to be left essentially untouched, new and tall buildings will have to be built elsewhere. This was also an argument in favor of the major projects Hudson Yards and Manhattan West. Because of the New York real estate market um, and the rents, many people are leaving Midtown to come to Hudson Yards. So it is interesting in that it's definitely destabilizing the balance of, of Manhattan. The Upper East Side on Central Park, then a few blocks south to 53rd Street. Three of the world's most important modern art museums are located within a radius of a little less than a thousand meters. The Museum of Modern Art on 53rd, surrounded by luxury boutiques and the most expensive offices, then the Guggenheim and the Met to the north. That was the heart of Manhattan in the 20th century. But the new era needs new locations. Even an established advanced culture can become a burden. The city was looking actually for ideas for Hudson Yards, a parcel of property that was city property. It was not part of, it was on the development site, but not part of the development, so it was sovereign. And the question was, um, if we preserve that for culture, if the city preserved that, what could be there in a city that has so much culture already? It has so many museums, so many galleries, so many theaters. Why does it need one more thing? The architectural office of Dillas, Gofidio, and Renfro began as an avant-garde undertaking. They weren't designing for convention, but experimenting and searching for an architecture that could influence and change society. They were the first to come up with the idea of planning a new cultural center for Manhattan on the wastelands of Hudson Yards. We proposed the shed to the city, and for many years, we were on our own. We were encouraged, but there was really no client, there was no institution, there was nothing called the shed. We just, we, at that point, we called it the culture shed. We have always viewed the evolution of the city and the evolution and development of our cultural institutions as inextricably linked. We maintained this idea for quite a long time until um, at one point uh, we had a visit from the mayor and the mayor came here and said, I wanna hear about this project. So we stepped back and we said, all right, we're now in the 21st century. Um, what does that mean for culture and what does that mean for us as a city? So he recognized that this was a strong idea and his administration uh, recognized this and then they supported the project. The then mayor, Michael Bloomberg, and his deputy, Dan Doktorov, began planning for this new cultural institution in 2014. It was to become a building with no precedent. Liz Diller's office and the designer David Rockwell teamed up and developed a joint concept. 
What's so satisfying about this project is that we were able to realize it from just uh, nowhere. It was a seedling of an idea um, that we put together with our uh, friend and colleague, uh, David Rockwell, just sitting around, just, just being very inventive about what could happen. And then came the hard work of actually proving it. The shed certainly uh, is, represents a lifetime of interest that I've had in um, how spaces get animated in different ways by storytelling. The ground floor, you can lift up this wall and you have a grid you could fly in. You could have a contiguous, almost 30,000 column free, 30,000 square foot column free space that connects the shed to the main building. The shed is inspired in a way by industrial um, infrastructure and the feel of that space is something that should be uninhibiting to artists. Um, it's fairly raw, so we're exposing everything, the structure, the mechanical system, is just a skin. It consists of um, three levels of galleries, and one additional space that's used for events. And this shed, and is able to deploy to the east into this position, which allows it slightly overlapping with the building. Ah, I drew it, not in the most beautiful way, but basically with its um, uh, full theatrical deck from which anything can be suspended. It wasn't just an autonomous idea about a new cultural entity. It was how it could help New York be better. Um, and bring back actually some of the productivity it lost um, after the 70s and 80s. Uh, and now it used to be the sort of center of art production and now it's the center of the art market. And that's a huge difference. And we wanted to bring it back to production and to pioneering new ideas about art. So this was very, very important. Parallel to Central Park, and then from the park down Fifth Avenue to the south, is where the money is. It always has been. There are still many galleries on Fifth Avenue because of the museums and shops. But as land and rents became increasingly unaffordable, even as early as the 1970s, many moved to Chelsea and the East Village, where the new generation of aspiring artists lived. Along with them, the new galleries also found success. David Sverner opened his first gallery in Soho in 1993. Today, he is one of the biggest art dealers worldwide. Money and art have always had a very close connection, more specifically perhaps capitalism and art, although this is a topic open to discussion. The artist can be relatively indifferent to that in the studio. Nevertheless, artists want to be in the public eye. And in this respect, one cannot live without the other. The ground is fertile here in New York. However, when you talk to young artists now, they will no doubt admit the day-to-day -day reality, the life of a young artist in New York, is very hard. The rents are exorbitant and not everyone can afford a studio. That's why a lot of work is actually produced elsewhere, in Los Angeles or Philadelphia, where a lot of young artists are also flocking. The more New York prospers, the stronger the art market in the city grows, and with it, the number of collectors and buyers. New York soon became the center of the world's art market, the three largest auction houses in the city had a turnover of 20 billion US dollars in 2018. New York City may well boast more artists than any other. They all want to be discovered, to develop and flourish in this melting pot of ideas and diversity.
Alongside the established museums and galleries, there were new platforms being created as early as the 70s of the 20th century. East Village, off the beaten track back then, boasted a burgeoning art and music scene. The rents were cheap, and no one could have foreseen that many of the artists who lived and worked there would become world famous along with the museums and galleries. We've never been a traditional museum. We don't have a collection. Um, we don't deal with the past uh, in that way. So we're dealing with the present and the future, and we, we've, we've never had a, we've never been conventional in that sense. Um, and we've always been pushing at the boundaries and asking what an institution can be, what an institution should be, what it can be, um, and responding to the changing needs of the world. The new museum is restricted to contemporary art and from the very beginning was conceived as a platform for up-and-coming artists who would not have their work shown in larger museums. We have formalized five years ago an incubator for our technology and design, so we've had over 400 cultural creatives working in this space uh, to explore a, an expanded idea of culture. Some of them are digital artists, but some of them are working on hybrid practices. The new build was designed by the Japanese architectural office SANA. The new ink is short for incubator of new ideas. The rooms directly adjoin the exhibition areas and the concept is very avant-garde. You can see here what happens to art and design when you give digital technology and entrepreneurial spirit free reign. We have um, two types of membership here. People can be what we call a community member, which means they can drop in anytime they'd like, um, but part-time, um, and they sort of work from these desks here. And then we have what we call track memberships. This is full-time membership. These are folks who run their studio out of New Ink. That means they come here every morning and they work every, until the evening. We have a digital production lab and a fabrication lab. We have conference rooms uh, where people can meet and share and also host client meetings or funder meetings. We have phone booths where people can take meetings. Um, we also do a lot of our social programming up here in the front. So this is when we do our happy hours and those types of things. This is where we put out all our drinks um, and really welcome people into the space. So what we want to do is actually making technology that's modular, easy to wear, easy to integrate into our clothing system or into existing clothing system that a lot of people could get access to, a lot of people could wear as well. We were really exploring this idea of how can we sense the cosmos, how can we make the imperceptible feeling of space actually become your body too, or sense on your body. Yeah, after all, I think art's just an idea, and these ideas need to be shared and need to spread, and that's, that's the whole premises of what art is. So we've created uh, what we call the Collective Museum of Private Collections. Uh, we call it Collectors. Uh, it is uh, where an independent public benefit corporation giving the public access to the world's tens of millions of unseen uh, private art collections. Um, yeah, we've been collecting for a little over 10 years and we realized that what was lacking in the art world today was accessibility and visibility. So all of these collectors have these amazing works, but nobody can see them unless you're friends with them and you happen to be in their home or living room. Um, so we realized like, there's so many historically important works that will never see the light of day. We realized that we really needed to do something about this. What if you put artists, urban planners, uh, architects, and a bunch of other people into a room together and talked about the most pressing issues of our age? Most likely you're going to get ideas and answers and solutions and even just questions you would not have otherwise gotten. New Ink grows directly out of that platform in that rather than doing that over a week or a weekend, we're doing that over a year and multiple years. So people come into our space, they spend a year, they spend two years, they spend three years, and that free flow of ideas and inquiry um, sort of gives birth to a whole new range of projects that would not have otherwise existed. We're committed to experimentation, uh, and we talk about incubating artists and ideas. That is really our primary mission, and it is a, a kind of a lab, and that does set us apart from other institutions. 
Uh, we have to take risks. We have to experiment. And we have to test out what a museum can be. Um, but then we have some very real issues like uh, uh, the lack of affordable workspace for artists here in New York City. So that is changing things quite dramatically. The new museum on the Bowery is right opposite the small scale East Village. Back towards Chelsea, you cross Canal Street, Chinatown's main drag. On the west side of Manhattan, further north, an additional influential art institution, The Kitchen, was founded at the same time as the new museum. It's a non-profit platform, a lab for artists, and this is where, for the first time in a larger setting, boundaries between performance art and visual arts were removed, with the blending of both genres becoming the norm rather than the exception. We have a theater, a performance area, and we have a gallery that we're able to actually hand over to artists and say, you can use the lighting systems in a particular way. You, know, you can use you know, the gallery you know, for your performance and have an installation you know, in the theater and begin to alter you know, the fundamental uses you know, of a place. When I think about the history of New York, when it comes to avant-garde, interdisciplinary work. And obviously, uh, the ground is incredibly fertile here. You know, there's no weakness in terms of, you know, is there a strong theater scene? Is there a strong dance and choreography scene? Is there an amazing performance scene? Obviously, you know, painting is amazing you know, in New York City. And there are actually a whole slew of organizations and institutions devoted to each of these single disciplines. And I think younger artists particularly are having to live in more places throughout the city. And there isn't that immediate coherence of an artistic community geographically that there was in your previous times. I don't think it's unique to New York, but I do think that you know, artists are having to live in multiple places you know, throughout you know, the city and even beyond the city, uh, sometimes moving you know, to, f say, Philadelphia. You know, it's been an unbelievable journey. I don't think any of us in 2008 believed when we started sketching that, that um, that, that idea would remain intact. And in fact, has become this, um, what I think is, is gonna be an extraordinary uh, cultural destination in the city that is both visual and performing arts melded together in a way that's not been done before. Our culture is very siloed in New York. So you have your visual artists doing stuff there, and you have your performing artists doing stuff there, and you have your designers doing things there, and um, so forth, and your dancers and your musicians and so forth. Um, I think that culture in the future is going to be something that we can't predict. We just have no idea. And the best way to future-proof a cultural entity in the future is to not define it too much. I find some of the things that are most interesting is the layering of it, that all of these other things can be going on at the same time, and they can interconnect. You can have a seating rake that breaks into the second floor and connects this. You can have a performance at an upper level that uses this as a fly loft. The shed is intended to be completely different from all the cultural mega centers that already exist. A lab for exhibitions and performances under one roof. Different genres in ever new combinations on six floors. And it's the sheer scale that makes the shed stand out. The huge space of the main hall is larger and higher than most opera or concert houses. And how can we create a place that, um, that will in some ways uh, be future-proofed because it is an architecture of infrastructure? On the way to timeless, you have to be willing to be timely. 
you have to be willing to be of your time. A year before the opening, construction is still in progress on all the buildings that, at the end of the first construction phase, will make up Hudson Yards. Behind the vessel, a walk-in spatial sculpture dominating the central square, the outer skin of the shed becomes visible, like the armor of an armadillo. From the street that runs towards the High Line, this zone slips into view, and you can see the volume that is covered by its skin. From the High Line, the building can be seen only in the axis, but returning to the plaza, the whole dimension of the building comes into its own. Liz Diller on her way across Times Square to the High Line. Six months before the opening of the shed and within sight of the construction site, the mile-long opera was performed for paying guests over six evenings. It's a temporary event on the High Line, which, above everything else, is supposed to be an urban park for New Yorkers. That is exactly the task of the shed, to be a new festival and exhibition venue for the citizens of the city and for artists from all over the world a contemporary platform right in the center of Manhattan and not just on the fringes of Brooklyn and Queens. And I say, okay, what do you have? And she says... Uh, the benefits that we had early on opening up in Williamsburg, um, we had very low overhead and our expectations were just so open that anything was possible. That's and part of the change in New York is just the real estate market change, is that there right. used to be places that cost hardly anything, a few hundred dollars a month, and so you didn't have to make money. You didn't have to sell work to make artwork to make money. You could do something else. It's harder to find that now in New York because there's uh, so much gentrification going on. It seems like everyone's being pushed and pulled and, and changed so quickly. You know, some of the galleries moved further out in Brooklyn right. to Bushwick or now Ridgewood, other areas in Brooklyn and Queens. Some people are doing, younger people starting now are doing more sort of cooperatives where they have four people together and they each curate a show or several shows and pool their resources. So I think that's a lot of what changed. Being in New York too, it's, you have the opportunity, there's so many artists and there's a density. So there is that opportunity to see a lot of work and artists here, but if you're living in in outskirts of a small city anywhere in the world, it's hard to have this opportunity to go to artist studios. Three spectacular bridges connect Manhattan with Brooklyn. In the meantime, directly on the other side of the East River, high buildings are going up, to be followed in the old industrial areas between Williamsburg and Bushwick on the way to a disused factory. Curated art fairs take place here, a sort of biennale for up-and-coming artists who don't have a gallery to represent them and can't afford a real studio. This program, supported by the city, gives them temporary spaces and the opportunity to present their works to the public in a spring show. We are right on the edge of Bushwick, which is an artist community that's like, there's a lot of, um, or there was a lot of less expensive real estate out here. So that's why we're here. The prices were uh, much more affordable for incredible high ceilinged industrial space. We are in an old printing factory that was completely retrofitted for the studios. And there are 35 workspaces in this, all three floors of this building. So, um, I mean, we're surrounded by industry and artists and some residential as well. I've been doing mostly videos and very technical stuff previously, and I got tired with that. So I, I uh, decided to try to paint and draw. And so it's all, all just the process of learning the craft, so to speak. Um, 
my name is Fatma Mohammed uh, from Qatar. Uh, I'm coming for here for the three months residency program uh, by the Qatar Museums Authority to ISCP. Uh, this program is very good. It, uh, it met different artists from around the world. It was really helpful and it helped me to explore my art. Uh, it was very intense. Well, we would like to stay here for as long as possible. Um, we rent this building. Um, we know that this is a good workplace and it's a good place for people to um, form this community of artists and curators that come to us from all over the world. Well, I think that it is um, the still considered the largest um, uh, concentration of artists and art spaces and art institutions in the world. Um, the real estate prices are prohibitive and thankfully the city government is extremely liberal and it has a lot of dedication to making sure that the arts are continued to be sustained and supported here. Most of the up-and-coming artists represented here have scholarships. Many of them live in Bushwick, which now fulfills the role that Chelsea and Williamsburg once did. For them, Manhattan is far away, the glittering, dazzling, high-rise city where those who have made it now live. The New York boom has now spread to Queens and the Bronx, where rents are rising and studios are becoming unaffordable. Far to the east of Brooklyn is Nathaniel Mary Quinn studio, a small room above his apartment. In 2013, up until that point, my work was very different. Um, I was more naturalistic as a painter. Then I got this opportunity to um, do like a like an art show and a, a, a very kind woman's brownstone in Brooklyn and I at the time had five paintings and I wanted to put a fifth work into the show and um, but I, I didn't have time to worry about all the details and intricacies embedded in the face um, so I thought to just use that which really count. I uh, would use construction paper to isolate areas, and I'd draw the eye in there, and more construction paper to isolate another area, then I'd draw the, the other eye there. And, and of course, the previous drawings are being covered with construction paper because construction paper is big, and, and you're using an X-Acto knife, and you're cutting through the paper, to, and you just, you you're feeling your way through the process, you know. It's fast, very, and, it's very, and I made the work in five hours, you know. And when I was done, I removed all the construction paper and the tape, and before me was a work that was so astounding that I had difficulty convincing myself that I made it. I couldn't believe that that had come out of me. It shocked me. It felt like someone else made it. And more importantly, immediately it became explicitly clear that our ultimate work that focuses on that which I continue to deal, which is how I began to make work about my family, the loss of my family. Yeah, 
I'm very, I'm very grateful, yeah. I mean, working with, you know, some of the top galleries in the world is truly a dream. It's a dream come true, yet it's a dream I don't recall quite having because I did not think such a thing would ever be possible for me. Nathaniel Mary Quinn grew up on the south side of Chicago. Unemployment, drugs, and crime were the rule. He managed to get a scholarship, and in the first holidays he returned home to find that his family had disappeared without leaving a message. On the day of the interview, it was announced that the Gagosian Gallery, one of the most important art dealers in the world, will represent Quinn in the USA. He has made it, he has made it to Manhattan. One of the opportunities that the Shed presents is an ability to commission, produce and present work across visual arts, performing arts and popular culture. Um, and to create a parity amongst the leading artists from all of those disciplines. So that you have a place where there is no real um, imposed hierarchy on a cultural landscape that inherently doesn't really have one. Uh, we as a society have placed a hierarchy on what is high art and what is low art, but human creativity comes from all parts of the world and all walks of life. And so we decided a very 21st century idea to create the world's most flexible or adaptable cultural institution because we were humble enough to acknowledge that we don't know what art is going to be. So I don't think we're creating some new fashionable thing that responds to the flexible world and the communication world that we are, that is also happening through the digital, the emergence of the digital age. I think this is a deep, this is deeply rooted in, in humans um, and their desire to create and how they create. Hudson Yards has been officially opened, as has the large shopping mall directly adjacent to the shed. It is the second weekend and thousands are pouring into the plaza. Only now, freed of its scaffolding, you can see how unique the building is. With a transparent skin over its huge volume, it pushes its way into the skyscraper tower at one end. This too was conceived by Liz Diller and David Rockwell. You can't be looking backward. Yes, you have to be cognizant of your past, and you have to use that past as a competitive advantage to define your future, um, but you have to be adaptable and able to actually encourage change. Good morning and welcome. I'm Dan Doctoroff, and I have the privilege of being the founding chair of the Shed's Board of Directors. Thank you, Dan. Everybody, I, I'm very impressed by Dan Doctoroff's new Vito Corleone voice. It's very... So, on behalf of all 8.6 million New Yorkers, congratulations. This is a great day for our city and we welcome the shed to the wonderful firmament of the greatest city in the world. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Thank you all your brave people for sticking this out. Uh, I'm Liz Diller. Anybody else? Yeah.
those trusses that you need to span across and you bring that load of the seal of the of the roof down through the walls you simply just trace the forces the structural forces to get the weight down to those six points in space and so it's extremely simple you know we're commissioning established artists we're commissioning early career artists and we're commissioning artists from the community they all are equal. We don't need to go into high and low. Hopefully those days are over and they certainly will never exist here. Only inside this shed do you experience its real dimensions. The hall is 40 meters high. The sound of rock concerts need space to spread. And the roof can be retracted to create an open air stage. What I really wanted to do was to not only be able to do visual arts, but to do all of the performing arts and pop. And I think particularly emphasis on that third area with amplification, uh, with capacity, really what the, the things I brought, I think, to the table to Liz's beautiful creation. But the great changes that Alex made when he came was he made it even more functional and actually more agile than it was when we first imagined. People keep saying, is it a museum, is it a performing arts centre, is it a pop museum? Well, it takes from all of those and creates a new kind of space, um, a decentered space, really. Via escalators, you access floors with fixed levels but retractable walls. From the top floor, you have a great view of the plaza. The opening programme of The Shed was a collaborative process involving many great artists, including film director Steve McQueen. The sensation at the opening is a coordinated performance by the painter Gerhard Richter, accompanied by a composition by Arvo Pert, especially created for The Shed and complemented by a sound image collage by Steve Reich. Our basic principle is to commission new work from leading artists and early career artists. And this was when I was asked to do the job. I, I said, look, the, the only way I can imagine coming to do this job for you is if we make the Shed a commissioning and producing house for all art forms. It's exciting, of course, you know, in terms of uh, bringing uh, disciplines together. And uh, we believe, you know, if we want to address the big questions of the 21st century, it's important to go beyond the fear of pooling knowledge and uh, bring you know, the disciplines into a contact. And at the end of the day, there are very few, few places in the world which can do that, because very often, you know, concert halls are for music, you know, opera houses are for opera, museums are for exhibitions. Um, and uh, in a way, this institution uh, is an institution for all art forms. That's the shadow. the impression of the space of the gallery when you go into the next one. This is a temporary wall, and as are the end walls temporary walls, the last one looks onto the shed, and it can also open up to make a very, very large footprint. I know what Reich needs and what Arvo needs. Um, Hans knows what Richter needs. We can create an environment in which they trust the institution, and I think trust is probably maybe the most important word of the day. So the idea that as the audience are coming in, I, I placed the choir in amongst the audience in civilian clothing and, and they walk in and, and you know, the audience are looking around and they're seeing this beautiful work and at, at one given moment it's as if the audience are singing, start to sing to the work and it's a very, very beautiful moment. I don't know anywhere who, who's commissioned a new work by Steve Reich and Gerhard Richter and present it and perform it 168 times. It's been nearly six years, labour of love. You know, for that culmination to be um, really, hopefully, get into the bloodstream of the city and, and her guests. Mm -hmm. 
While the Reich Richter Pert performance is announced upstairs, rehearsals for the opening concert curated by Steve McQueen are taking place in the main hall below. Two days later, the time has come. After more than four years of work, the shed opens its doors to New York and New Yorkers. The opening concert is a collaboration between Steve McQueen and Quincy Jones with the title The Soundtrack of America, a musical collage like a journey through time, which is intended to show the influence of Afro-American culture on today's pop culture. Great art and performance and pop, everything will happen at the same time in this building. And I want to welcome you to the shed. I want to welcome you to Soundtrack of America. I thought to myself, that's what I want to do. I want to do a live concert. I didn't want to sort of do something with Alex that was about catching dust in the museum. I wanted to be live and joyous. I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill. And a thousand violins begin to play Oh, it might be the sound 